when you look back at surveys of what do good bosses do, there was a famous study by Google Project Oxygen, and they said the number one thing was actually being a good coach, actually having interest in the welfare of people and trying to support people rather than telling them what to do. And This episode is brought to you by WHU, the Otto Beisheim School of Management. WHU is reshaping the way students learn about business, management, finance, and entrepreneurship through its innovative programs and partnerships in Germany and across the globe. To learn more about this globally ranked university, visit whu.edu today. Hey folks, Garrett here. In this episode of the Most Awesome Founder Podcast, I'm once again joined by my colleague and friend, Dr. Dries Fahms, to discuss the topic of organizational ambidexterity with Dr. Julian Birkinshaw, Professor of Strategy and Entrepreneurship at London Business School. We touched on a wide array of topics, including Julian's journey from business to academia, the need for adaptability and alignment to drive innovation, how corporates embed this ethos into their practices, and so much more. I hope you enjoyed this conversation as much as we did. Coming to you from WHU, on the banks of the Rhine River, in beautiful Fallendar, Germany, this is the best and most awesome founder podcast. A show about entrepreneurs, innovators, advisors, and educators, and the stories that make them who they are today. Dr. Julian Birkenshaw, thank you so much for joining us on the podcast today. You are most welcome. Glad to be here. Yeah, it's uh, it's great to have you. Uh, both myself and, of course, my colleague Dries have uh, been uh, anxiously awaiting this conversation. I think the the work that you have done is uh, is very relevant to to Dries's academic work, but also quite relevant to to my practical work and my day to day life. So, um, looking forward to digging deeper. But um, as we do with all of our guests, we like to kick things off with a little bit of storytelling. So if you could, maybe you could start by telling us a, a little bit about your life's journey, where you come from and how you ended up where you are today. Okay. Well, look, I mean, I, I was born in the UK and I live in the UK, but, but that's, uh, there's an awful lot of ground in between. So, you know, I was, um, I was a geology graduate uh, and then I took a job in IT information technology consulting, both of which were sort of false starts. But then I went over to Canada uh, in the mid, uh, what, late late 80s uh, to do an MBA. And and I kind of never looked back because I did the MBA and I enjoyed the, the studying of business so much that led to a PhD. So six years in Canada and then a further three years, I think it was in Sweden. And then I moved to the UK again back in 99 and I've been here ever since. So so my, I don't think anybody can really claim that their their sort of life plan was mapped out in advance. But mine was basically one, one lucky accident after another, basically. So, yeah. Amazing. I actually, uh, I did my master's degree in Canada, and and that too changed my uh, complete career trajectory. So, um, I, I don't know if it's the fresh air or the open lands, but makes you makes you think broadly. Um, Dries, I know you had something that you were itching to talk about, so why don't I pass the baton to you? Yes, thanks, Garrett. So, so Julian, you have in your writings written a lot about innovation, and in a lot of the papers you have emphasized that, that companies need both uh, adaptability and alignment. So you call them two different capabilities. Now, for our audience, can, can you explain a bit more about what we need to understand by these two concepts? Yeah, I mean, the... As you say, the idea that companies are doing kind of two slightly contradictory things at the same time. I mean, this has sort of been around forever, but we use different language at different times. And um, as you say, I, I was using the term alignment, which, of course, means the ability to make sure all of the activities of the company are sort of lined up, as it were, behind some sort of overarching objective. I mean, that kind of makes sense as a thing to do. But the more aligned we are, the more rigid we become. And so in a changing world, we obviously have to figure out how to adapt as well. And adaptability almost by definition means sometimes taking things out of alignment and sometimes allowing new projects to start up in other markets, in other parts of the company, 
that don't really don't really match with what the company is making money in right now. So, so that is a, a phenomenon, as I think we'd agree, is is seen in pretty much any company. And that was one of the kind of, I guess, the key themes that I was exploring back in the early 2000s in my academic research. Yeah, and a lot of scholars, eh, you were not the only one looking into this topic on how you can combine, as some people also call it, exploitation <laughs> and exploration. And often people would say, ah, you need to separate them. Eh? You mm, need to exactly. tangle them. And you have written uh, together with, with your colleague Gibson, work where you say, no, there is an alternative way, namely what you called at that point, contextual ambidexterity. Yeah. Can you explain a bit yeah. more this kind of alternative yeah. view on this important yeah. topic? Yeah, indeed. So as you say, the conventional wisdom is you're starting up a new business, um, which by definition is going to lose money before it makes money. And often it's in conflict with the existing business. Sometimes it's literally cannibalizing the sales of the existing business. And sometimes it's got a completely different business model. And so that conventional wisdom, as you say, was you you pull it out, put it into a separate unit and give it freedom to, to sort of work on its own, on its own agenda. Uh, and that became known as, in the literature, structural ambidexterity. Ambidexterity is doing these two different things at the same time, structural meaning. You know, you you build it into the structure. So um, you're referring to my research now, which was published in 2004, but obviously the work was done a few years earlier. Um, and with Christina Gibson, we were looking at what made uh, big, successful companies. And this is companies like, I mean, like Oracle, like Renault. I mean, huge companies with 50,000 plus employees. What made them able to adapt to changing market situations. And we measure a lot, bunch of stuff as you do. And we actually came to the view that, that the structural solution, carving things out as a separate business, is not the only way to generate ambidexterity. And we had this notion that, in fact, within a business unit, uh, the people who are kind of closest to the action are, of course, the people who are best positioned to understand, if you like, the relative balance that they need to have between you know, aligning things and then adapting to new things. And our, our research kind of bore out that observation. And so in order to kind of make the paper interesting to our academic friends, we kind of we found this kind of snappy title, which was contextual ambidexterity. So what is contextual ambidexterity? It is the, the behaviors and the practices in a business that enable an organization to, to change, to adapt, while still remaining broadly aligned around its existing activity. So that is the big idea in the paper. We call it contextual ambidexterity, as you say. Um, and that became a very, very well-cited paper, my most cited paper of okay. all time, based on this one very simple idea. And, and can you maybe give a kind of practical example of how this contextual ambidexterity yeah. looks like in the real world? Yeah. So you see, it, whereas the structural concept starts with the chief executive saying, you know, here is a new business area that's important. So I'm going to carve it out and put it in a separate place and I'm going to have it reporting into me directly. The contextual ambidexterity concept, and we could even call it cultural ambidexterity because it really is about how individuals spend their time. We're trying to get to the point that, that, the, that the managers within a business unit, their job is to create an environment, a culture, in which people you know, deliver their best work and they feel safe and free to explore new ideas. And what we're trying to do is to help them to be both, shall we say, supported in what they're doing, so feel free that, that they've actually got a, their boss behind them is helping them to, to try new stuff. But they're also feeling that there is some sort of discipline around delivering on the day results. So it literally does come down to these almost micro level behaviors. We're trying to encourage managers to put in place a culture where people feel free to take initiative. People feel that it's actually appropriate to, to just put a little bit of time aside on new ideas to follow up those ideas, and then to, when the time is right, to kind of develop them and, and take them further. So, that, so it really is it's a very, very uh, micro-level 
organizational thing around how people how people operate on the front lines. And and so would you, for instance, see the the eighty twenty model that Google introduced, for instance? Would you see that as an example of contextual yeah. ambiguity or um, is- Absolutely. So Google, I mean, I guess other companies like 3M kind of tried it earlier, but Google had this concept of innovation time off, which was that particularly a certain group of software engineers, they were literally encouraged to spend 20 of their time, 20% of their time working on pet projects. So so look, that is a very, um, I would say, sophisticated way of doing it, because, of course, it does take a company a certain level of, of kind of self-confidence to be able to say we are going to deliberately allow you guys to dabble on the side but it's exactly the same sort of thing another another idea i i am another way of operationalizing it is we see a lot of companies will create these special project teams off to the side uh, john carter calls this the dual operating model and the idea there is everyone's got their line responsibility but in addition to that we're trying to free up to have a 20 percent of their time not to work on their own pet projects but to join some sort of project team which sanctioned from above to work on some sort of change initiative. And again, that's it's really about trying to always take an individual person and separate their time out so that they're doing both things themselves rather than the separation happening, if you like, at the level of the company. Okay. Maybe Gareth, to you, <laughs> but does it sound appealing to you, contextual and dexterity as a practitioner? I, I mean, it... I, well, I, I have never worked for that kind of company, so I would probably defer on that. But um, what I do is is build ventures for, for big corporates. And, um, you know, I'm interested maybe in the limitations of these kind of two different approaches. When you think of structural versus contextual ambidexterity, um, you know, and, and to steal from Steve Blank and some others talking about the different horizons of innovation, right? Like if you're if you're creating a culture where people can tinker and play and and you know innovate, but it's not embedded structurally somehow, what are the limitations of that? Like, and if they want to do something very disruptive or stumble upon something disruptive, what happens then? So we'll take the kind of the limitations of each model. I mean, we'll we'll go to the the structural model where you carve out the team. In a separate place. I mean, I don't know how well your audience knows the the coffee company called Costa Coffee, which is now part of Coca Cola. But I wrote a case study about their their new kind of third generation vending machine, and they created that literally with just an external partnership, uh, a bunch of companies, people from other companies. They created this cool coffee machine. They did it at arm's length from the company. Uh, it was done, delivered in record time. The whole thing was created in about a year. But, and this is the point, once they delivered it back to you know the boss, as it were, the chief executive, the company didn't know what to do with this thing. And it took them another 18 months, as it were, for the, for the mainstream organization almost like to catch up because they hadn't built any links across. A lot of people were skeptical. A lot of people were downright sort of envious that they hadn't been allowed to do this themselves. And so that, in a nutshell, sort of clarifies both the benefits and the risks of the separate entity. If you move to contextual ambidexterity, the idea that people within the company are free to make their own choices. Um, on the one hand, it's very energizing for those individuals. Everyone feels they've got a little bit of a part to play. It's quite difficult to get everybody to take that seriously, but that's a that's a leadership challenge. Um, the problem is that those things rarely scale. In other words, as a mechanism for, you know, coming up with kind of neat little ideas for this and that. And if all you're doing is efficiency improvements, process improvements, that's fine. I mean, you know, someone in a factory has responsibility for doing that. But imagine you are in Costa Coffee and, you know, someone on the front line says, I want to create a new vending machine. I mean, they have they have no bandwidth for the doing that. They have no resources. So, so if you take the contextual route, you have to understand that this is this is not actually a substitute for occasionally spinning things out as separate entities. It is a good mechanism for energizing people, for getting lots of good ideas to come through. But then you need a kind of complementary mechanism to figure out how to then scale up the most attractive things. And you must have seen that if you're doing kind of corporate venturing activities. I mean, a lot of these corporate venturing units fail, not because they don't have good ideas, but because you know they, they do too many little things and, and none, none of them actually gets the visibility and the top level sponsorship to really make a difference to move the needle. Right. 
Right. I, I want to I want to touch on another piece that you know you've talked about already quite a bit, which is which is people, um, and you know empowering people to to take risks and to try new things. Um, I think some might argue that that could be a different profile than someone that would choose the stability and security of a, of a corporate career. Uh, are there, I know Dries always hates it when I talk about behavioral psychology, it's one of my favorite topics, but when you, when you think about the risk profiles of these people working for companies, they're on a career trajectory. If they veer off that trajectory, they could end up paying the price later. No, of course, that's, that is correct. In other words, um, a lot of people join large companies because they want a stable job. Um, and, you know, you make it through a company um, more often by not screwing up rather than sort of taking the big bets, which may or may not work out. Uh, and of course, that does create these rather risk averse behaviors that we that we see in companies. So, you know, a huge trend over the last 20 years, of course, has been you know big companies, big established companies trying to kind of learn from Silicon Valley, trying to learn from the, the Amazons and the Googles of this world about how do you actually inculcate that, that mindset of a bit more risk-taking in these, in these companies. And, and I, I don't think any of the big established companies have really mastered this. I mean, it is, it's, it's not impossible, but I, I'll give you a German example. Um, I was on Bayer Corporation's uh, innovation uh, panel for a few years. They did a huge change program in buyer trying to get you know, tens of thousands of people across the company being more innovative and it was a reasonably successful program but you know did they actually fundamentally change the culture of buyer i don't think they did because you know, you've got a hundred thousand plus employees um a lot of the basic mechanics of how a company like that works are, are not are up for change and so what you're doing is you are you're seeding kind of uh, an opportunity, a way of looking at the world, a number of training courses and so forth. And what you're trying to do, of course, is you're trying to get those people who are a little bit more, um, you know, risk risk taking. I mean, a little bit more up for doing something a little bit different. So so you just sort of accept the fact that you're not going to win everybody over. But you do know within a company that size, that there's going to be a big chunk of, a, you know, a few thousand people, let's say, who you can you can get 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 to be involved in such things. So that's the way I think about it. I mean, of course, Amazon is now 1.6 million people. So it's a larger company than any of these. But but Amazon was born this way, right? And and that's the big difference, right? A company that's born with a bunch of kind of, you know, fast forward sort of lean startup kind of roots is always going to find an easier job of it than one that's reinventing itself. And maybe to push a bit further on this personal issue, because at least in my experience, if I see that that within companies there is some room for mm. experimentation, for exploration, often when the 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 going gets tough, uh, meaning there is some pressure, you see that the time for exploration quickly I... evaporates, and all the focus will be on exploitation. Mm. Do you think there are ways to avoid that kind of pressures? I mean. It... Of course, you're completely right, and it's it's almost unavoidable. In other words, look when when there is a downturn or when there's a um, you know difficult situation, uh, you know you miss your profits, whatever. The company, you know, what do they do? They of course they cut costs and they tend to sort of centralize power as well, and they take away all that stuff. So the the companies that are most successful in these sort of programs are almost always the ones which have built this you know this plat this solid platform of profitability. And they typically got a chief executive who's been around a few years and is is hugely credible within within the kind of the investor community, and he or she is in a position to essentially to, to experiment to, to to dabble on the side. So, so it is it is very very hard to avoid that situation. The one the one exception I will acknowledge on that is, of course, in COVID, um, you know that was a shock. That was a crazily difficult time for everybody. You know, of course, at some level, in some sense, there was centralization, but there was also this huge freedom to do new things, right? I mean, you know, we we all, as academics, learned to teach online in a matter of weeks, right? And so, and of course, every industry had its own challenges in doing that sort of thing. So it is, it's worth kind of saying, you know, let's not lose what we got in COVID because in terms of responding to, to stress, because, you know, yes, yes, it was a bad time, but we 
sorted things out. We created opportunities for change, which actually go against the the usual rule of things, which is you know crisis leads to centralization. So, so yeah, that's a quick thought on that point. I'm I'm curious about uh, contextual ambidexterity in practice, the, especially when you have a large organization um, that you know it. it is hierarchical, there's multiple different management layers. Um, do you see this as something that has to be embedded from top to bottom, or can it just occur across the, the knowledge worker layers or something along those lines? Yeah, and look, I'll, I'll be honest. I mean, you take, I mentioned Amazon earlier. I mean, we think of Amazon as this really cool, innovative company, right? Well, you know, 90% of Amazon people are working in, you know, fulfillment centers and uh, on the road. I mean, 90% of them have no freedom at all. So. You know, we, we end up always focusing on the 10% who do have the kind of the, the cool jobs. Um, so I will I will acknowledge that point. The um, the problem you've got is the following, which is that as soon as you've got multiple layers, four, five, six layers, um, it is very difficult for somebody, you know, several layers down to really completely kind of uh, deliver on some of these slightly unusual ways of working if their boss is an old school person, right? Because, you know, we talk a lot about agile right now, right? I mean, agile teams are everywhere. The whole point of agile is the team or the squad is making its own decisions and they are figuring out their own schedule. They're working to their schedule. They're doing things when they want. You know, the person who oversees that agile squad, you know, doesn't understand the details of what they're doing. But if their boss insists on detailed weekly updates, then the benefit of agile is then lost, if you see what I mean. So, so yeah, that's a long-winded way of saying that it's, you know, if you are a mid-level person, it's really hard to make progress on this if you've got an old school boss. And therefore, what we need to be doing is to try to get the culture change coming from the top. And, the, and when I say the top, it doesn't have to be the chief executive. It could absolutely be a specific business unit. I mean, you know, there is a sort of a level of analysis where a business unit head says, this is what we're trying to do. And he or she then has to work very hard to make sure the right people are in those roles. Because we all know that um, one, one kind of old school leader who is very suspicious and doesn't give any freedom, the risk is that he or she kind of infects the whole organization with, with the old style of working. So you've got to work doubly hard on getting the right people into those leadership roles. Can you maybe tell a bit more about what kind of profile this kind of manager needs to have. So, as you were saying, yeah. it can yeah. be the old fashioned, yeah. that is very uh, suspicious. So if, if you need to hire people uh, for uh, a contextual ambidextrous organization, yeah. Yeah, what yeah. kind of profiles would yeah. you have? Yeah, uh, it's, a, it's a, again, a good question. I mean, so, I mean, we often start with this sort of stereotypical kind of historical view of command and control where the boss you know, knew everything, the boss, you know, oversaw everything. I mean, that's a little bit sort of doesn't really exist anymore, but it is a sliding scale from that type of boss all the way through to the boss who is actually energizing and getting the most out of his or her people. Let me just talk a bit about what that profile looks like. I mean, he or she, first of all, has a clear sense of direction. They do absolutely know where they are going. But of course, they are stating that purpose or mission or whatever you want to call it in such a way that everybody feels both inspired, but also feels they've got a bit of space to find their own way within that direction. So has a sense of direction. And then secondly, um, is sort of profoundly interested in people development. You know, when you, when you look back at surveys of what do good bosses do, there was a famous study by Google Project Oxygen. And they said the number one thing was actually being a good coach, actually having interest in the welfare of people and trying to support people rather than telling them what to do. And this is Google where, you know, being a good techie, you know, you'd think it was the most important thing. It's actually less important. So having a sense of vision, being a an enabler of people by being a coacher and supporter of them, providing kind of support when needed, trying to kind of remove roadblocks. And then we talk a lot about this nowadays, being tolerant, of course, with some sense of failure, right? And and that, it's easy to say and devilishly difficult to do, but we've got to find a way of of allowing people to to try stuff out and to not feel that they are, you know, in any way sort of threatened or or punished if they 
if things don't work out. So that's, you know, our OB friends, our organizational behavior friends. I mean, they talk about this a great deal, but I think it is a, it's a very profound model. And a lot of, a lot of people are, are heading that way, I would say. Okay. Gary, go ahead. Yeah. So I find this, I find it really an interesting topic because I, I can definitely see and, and from experience how, you know, the, the one kind of benevolent, open-minded leader that is trying to empower their team can kind of create the, these conditions of autonomy that will, will foster this. But I, I, as I'm putting it in the context of a larger organization and you've got, you know, multiple business units that are all, you know, they have to collaborate in one way or another, or are sometimes competitive uh, for resources and things uh, of that nature, then you really have to have it horizontally across the entire organization for it to work effectively. Is that is that a fair assessment? And I think, look, ideally, you absolutely do that. Um, and you also work on whatever bonus scheme it is that ensures that people feel that you know, helping everybody else out also helps them. I mean, you know, the the investment banking world of eat what you kill, um, I mean, it sort of works in investment banking because you can absolutely um, identify, you know, when you've done a big trade or when you brought in a big new client. But in most companies, in most industries, um, you can't do that because as you as you rightly say, if I succeed, sometimes I'm doing it at the expense of others. So so I'm I'm all I'm all in favor of if you have some sort of bonus scheme for it to have, you know, a bigger group level component than individual component. And what we're trying to do, of course, is create that that type of cultural setup where people genuinely feel, um, you know, that it's it's their business to help their colleagues. And yeah, so there's much more we can say about that. But that's the, that's the rough direction of travel. Well, I, I want to drill down on on one uh, small piece that you mentioned because I think it's it's so critical and it's just such a, a big topic in the entrepreneurial world that I'm in too, which is this this uh, fear of failure aspect, right? Like that plays that fear can play such a fundamental role in human behavior, right? And um, how do you see that just, you know, a, a leader of a business unit or a leader of a, a team can mitigate that on their own? Or are there structural requirements that are, are needed in order for that to kind of be a, a hurdle that you can overcome? Yeah, I mean, obviously, most big companies, uh, unlike you know, the VC world, you know, individuals get you know, very, very limited bonuses for creating new stuff. I mean, they they're much more likely to get a promotion than a a sort of significant bonus. There's a few exceptions, but that's, but that is kind of the normal way of doing it. So, so as a leader, you know, your job is to, is to try to lead by example. Um, I mean, I'll be very, I'll give you, I'll give you a couple of specific thoughts. Um, you know, one, one famous story is you legitimize failure by having an award for failure. Um, Tata Group in India, you know, they have a, they have an award for their the best the best failure, uh, and every year they have a bunch of other awards. And one of them is actually an award for the best you know failure in a learning opportunity, or whatever they call it. So that's one model. And then there's another model I've seen where uh, it was a head of a smallish business, a sort of 400 person business, and he actually created um, uh, what he called a failure share uh, in his management meeting. So a lot of mining companies and you know have safety shares that you start the meeting with. You know, your top tip for safety as a means of building a culture to make sure that safety is taken seriously. He said, I want to take failure seriously. We're going to kick off each meeting with somebody, and I'm going to start with myself, um, telling us about a project that you've done in the recent months which did not work out. And this is this is why it didn't work out, and this is what we learned from it. And he tried to push people to both look at the, if you like, the you know, the both sides of the balance sheet. In other words, you know, we often focus on the, the risks of failure, the costs. He said, let's actually give proper play to the, the benefits. You know, what are the things that we learn? What are the, you know, new relationships we built? What are the you know, development opportunities we created for people? And if you start laying out what some of those positives as well as the negatives, people start to see a much more balanced view of it. So none of these is a panacea, right? I mean, this is the hardest problem to crack that that I've, I've ever seen in a kind of a management context. But those are a couple of thoughts. Maybe because you have been working on this topic for the yeah. last 20 years, um, 
how has your thinking about a combining alignment and adaptability evolved over time? Mm. Do you see yeah. today a different name yeah, yeah. or is it still quite stable? Yeah, it's a great question. I think the um, the concept of contextual ambidexterity, I mean, it's a nice addition to the academic sort of theory, but but to sort of position it as almost like an alternative to structural ambidexterity does actually miss the point because, you know, okay. over the years, the more I see what companies are actually doing, you know, I see the best run companies doing both, essentially. I mean, I really genuinely see them trying to work on these micro level behaviors through their leadership teams. But I also see them doing a whole range of projects and initiatives off to a side because, you know, the biggest challenge I'm going to say is being able to scale up your new ideas on the right timeline, if you see what I mean. So I'll give you a very specific example. Um, there's a British educational publisher called Pearson. So everyone's heard of it. I mean, they're the biggest educational publisher in the world. They used to own the Financial Times. They used to own Penguin Books. Uh, I had the, the chief executive in my class literally this morning, um, the former chief executive. And he said, you know, the trouble is that we could see that publishing was moving from analog to digital. We could see that, you know, we were making a lot of money selling textbooks into universities and high schools, particularly in the US. And we could see that at some point that was going to go digital. Um, but we didn't know when. And, and of course, you know, he, he, his, it was his call to decide that at some point we have to kind of pull the plug on paper-based texts and take the earnings hit because you just know for sure that the short term you're going to take an earnings hit mm. um, and to know when to do that to make sure you've got all the capabilities sort of in place so that you're ready for that shift for me that's the hardest single thing and and i can think of spectacularly famous cases of companies that went into a new technology too early and i can think of many that of course got it latent and died but to get the timing right that is the that's the really difficult thing. So for me, ambidexterity is all about getting the timing of the transition right. That's the that's the big core that you've got to work on. Everything else is important, but doesn't obviously move the dial in the same way. So a, a lot has changed in the work environment in the past well, 18 years since this was first published, um, but even uh, more so in the past four or five years, right? We've, uh, uh, we're dealing with automation, complete change in, in workforce. You know, AI is, is creating a new generation of, of generalists rather than technical specialists. COVID has exacerbated, you know, just our work environment and how collaboration works in, in general. How do you see, do you see this kind of changing work environment as an opportunity or more as a challenge to be able to execute on this? So we'll, we'll separate out the whole kind of AI technology piece from the COVID virtual working piece. Mm -hmm. If we take AI first, uh, and the first observation to make, of course, is that this is, you know, we're just in the latest chapter of a 60-year evolution, right? I mean, we've had computerization and automation uh, going on since the 60s. And even though people talk about AI changing this fundamentally, the actual use cases of artificial intelligence in companies are still mostly fairly prosaic. And so what typically happens, and I actually do believe that this is what's going to happen, is we do see automation and we do see um, some jobs being made redundant. Uh, and, and in their place, we see new jobs emerging, people who are much better at taking that data and creating greater efficiency out of it. So, you know, a lot of the a lot of the technophiles hate that argument, they say, but you know, you know, that was then and this is now and everything's suddenly gone exponential. Um, but my answer is look, I've been around long enough to to say I've heard that story before. So I'm not saying technology is not going to change things. I'm just very conscious that that you know, society has figured out ways of adapting to new technology before. So that's my somewhat sort of skeptical worldview on the AI side of things. If you go to virtual, the story is a bit different, actually, because it does seem clear to all of us that you know, the ability to work from home, particularly for white collar workers, is now you know sort of built into our 
our view of how how office life is going to work. And some companies are are trying to push everybody back, but it is so much more sensible now to to be able to have a, a, a mix. And I think that everything I was saying earlier about the challenges of leadership and management are just made more acute by the virtual workplace. And for reasons which are pretty obvious, right, which is that, you know, why do we need to be in office? Well, we be, need to be in an office for, you know, collaborative work. We need to be there to build relationship with clients and customers. And we need to be there to kind of, you know, reinforce the culture. Um, and those things, you know, can all be done with probably less time uh, in the office than before, but they cannot be completely replaced. So, so I, I'm, I'm certainly of the view that as leaders and managers of others, we have to be much smarter about devoting the time to helping people along, particularly the ones who have this sort of affinity for for working from home, because the risk is they become almost like subcontractors, right? I mean, subcontracting project-based work has always existed as this sort of you know category of work. People just dial in to do their work. I don't want our employees to be doing that. If you want to actually have a career, you've got to be prepared to invest time in the social fabric of the organization. Now, Julian, you, you're teaching a lot of high-level executives in your yep. PMP programs, again, yeah. programs. Yeah. If you discuss with them about the current challenges around the topic of innovation, what kind of topics do they mention? What keeps them away at night about yeah, yeah. innovation? So they all get very excited by disruption, right? In other <laughs> words, um, they, you know, this is, you know, this is it. This is the, the chief executive's worst nightmare is to be the, the next business school case study like Kodak and Blockbuster, right? Yeah. And so, <laughs> so they, they absolutely want to, I was teaching this morning, the course was on managing a digital organization. And of course, we talked about digital disruption. So they, they, they start with that. Um, and then, of course, they also want to know a little bit about, I'm going to say, the, the varieties of innovation. Because, you know, you typically start with product innovation, but very quickly nowadays, they want to know about business model innovation, right? Because, you know, the companies that they, that they see around them, you know, they're all kind of the Spotify's and the Netflix and so forth. And they've all got these platform-based business models. So they want to understand how they can be the next, you know, the Spotify of their industry. You know? <laughs> and I'm afraid the bad news is that almost all of them cannot become the Spotify of their industry because, you know, first of all, you know, there's a sort of a first mover advantage out there. And if there was a role to become the Spotify of an industry, you know, we're now at a point in the cycle where most of those opportunities have gone. And then the second point is, of course, that, that actually as an incumbent, it's very, very hard for you to take on that sort of platform ownership place you can be you can be a player on somebody else's platform but to own the platform is difficult you know people would say well why did sony um, or universal not create i the itunes or spotify mm. and of course the reason is pretty obvious right it's because you know they were competing with the other three or four big music publishers and so it took apple and then spotify to to create the platform the neutral platform on which they all Got. So, you know, it's a it's a salutary tale, but, you know, very few companies are actually going to become the next big business model. So there you go. There's a couple of thoughts. Disruption, new business models. Another personal research interest of mine is is management model innovation, actually innovating how we work. But we've already kind of touched on that. You know, 20 minutes ago, we were talking a lot about, you know, agile ways of working, trying to get more bottom up um, input into decision making. And, and there are companies out there that are are pushing those ways of managing to try to sort of see what the limits of that are. So those are the types of topics of innovation that I'm, I find interesting. Okay. So much so my students. If you have a second, I would, I, I find this topic of, of management, you know, level innovation, uh, really relevant. I, we spend so much time focusing on the firm and, Far, it seems to me far less time focusing on the individual. Um, can you? Would you mind diving a little bit deeper into that? How we as managers and leaders can do a better job to foster it in our team. I mean, so one way of answering that question is you can start with some of these sort of outliers. In other words, companies that have kind of pushed the traditional model furthest. So, um, and and over the years, there've been many of these companies have kind of come and gone. One current example, which I kind of like, 
is the gaming company called Valve. They're based in Seattle. Um, and Valve has, what, 500 employees? No management roles. Nobody has the formal title of manager. I mean, there's a boss, Gabe Newell. Um, and they, they have this philosophy that everyone is hired to figure out the best place that they can add value to the system. And of course, they've got a very rigorous hiring process. But the theory is if you get in, then it's up to you to figure out how to be useful and you figure out what team to join and figure out what opportunity best matches your skills. Now, I raise that as an example, not because it's necessarily the model that established companies should use, but because it, it, it shows us sort of what's possible and indeed the, the limits of that. Because when you dig under the surface of this company valve, what you discover is that the, uh, sort of an informal hierarchy has emerged within the company, even though no one's officially got the title of a manager. And so they, they absolutely still celebrate people coming up with new projects and forming teams to do new stuff. But to get things done, you do then go to a, a group of senior people who've been there a long time, and they use their own political power, if you like, to sort of find their way through the system. So the point is, all this talk about kind of self-organizing and bottom-up systems is beautiful in terms of freedom to act. But actually, it's not quite, it doesn't quite work. You, you actually need a system where there is some combination of top-down control and some combination of, of, of bottom-up. And of course, that is going to vary depending on the activity. So, you know, one of the books I wrote recently, I separated out bureaucracy from meritocracy from adpocracy. And I think almost intuitively, without me defining these words, you know what I mean, because everyone understands bureaucracy is governing through rules. Meritocracy is, you know, collaborating around knowledge and expertise. Ad adocracy is your world, Garrett. I mean, it's the world of startups. It's the world of trying anything, s see what works. And when something seems to be working, you kind of, you kind of ride it. And, and my point is that big companies will always be some combination of these three different models. It's, you know, if you take a big bank, by definition, the compliance functions, the risk management has to be bureaucratic. It's required. But then you're going to have big chunks where there are, you know, analysts and there's R&D people or whatever who are operating in a meritocracy. And then you're going to have people moving into new markets. Maybe the traders are going to be working in an ad hocracy way. And, and so the way I try to help people to think about it is to say, you know, each of these models has its own kind of formula, its own set of practices. And your job is not just to say bureaucracy is bad, adhocracy is good. Your job is to say, what is the right model for this particular set of activities at this particular point? And of course, that puts a lot of burden on the leader of that unit, because that leader's got to say, actually, right now, we need to become a little bit more ad hoc. So that's the, I mean, there's much more I could say on that, but that's the way I typically think about management model innovation. I, I, I love that term ad hocracy. Um, you're going to hear it more because I just stole it from you, Julian. I, I, I love that concept. <laughs> I mean, what, there's a leadership guru called Warren Bennis, who I think coined the term probably 50 years ago. So I, I kind of reinvented it. I stole it from him with due attribution, of course. Nice. I'll do the same. <laughs> now, Julian, when I hear you talking, I also have a feeling that you're saying that corporates should be a bit modest in their ambitions. Uh, they should not think that they will be the next disruptors with a big platform, that they should not be the ones that will completely explore and come up with new things. Is, is that a right observation or am I now? I mean, so, yeah. And of course, they hate it when I, I mean, I never said quite, quite such, such terms. I mean, I would never say have modest ambitions. What I would say is be be very conscious of the the size of the market opportunity in your in your area um and be conscious that as soon as you move beyond that you know you're often getting into places where there are some you know there are some big beasts and sometimes those are big tech beasts and sometimes there are other industries and you know every industry when i work so last week i was with an insurance company and i was with an automotive parts company um and both of them said, our biggest nightmare is what if kind of Google um, or Microsoft kind of decides to enter our industry and they, you know, come along and kind of 
you know, create that sort of information layer that controls the flow of information within our industry and relegates us to subordinate status. Now, I don't think that, that that's very likely in many cases. You know, Google does not want to get into insurance and they, don't, they couldn't handle the regulation for one thing. Um, but the point is that as an insurance company, um, you know, the world insurance is growing at whatever, the three or four percent a year, right? So, so there's no harm in having ambitions to grow above the rate of, you know, market growth. Um, but this is a mature industry, um, and every so-called blue ocean opportunity you see, chances are there's a bunch of other companies, you know, trying to trying to get into that as well. And so, you know, and I, I wouldn't say this up front, but I would absolutely, in the course of the conversation, um, try to help them to recognize the, the risks of those, those sort of strategies as well as the opportunities. So. Yeah, clear. Yeah. So, Julian, to be cognizant of, of your time, um, I want to kind of bring this full circle and, you know, bring it back, bring it back to you. Because in the end, uh, uh, this podcast is to, to learn about people as well as uh, their wisdom to impart. So um, since we do have a lot of young people in the uh, university setting listening to this, um, we ask everyone the same question, which is, you know, what advice would you have for your younger self? Like, what have you learned over the course of your career that uh, you wish you could go back a few years and, and tell yourself? What wisdom, or maybe one key point of wisdom you like to share with the next generation? Gosh. I mean, as I said right at the outset, I, I kind of got lucky. Uh, and, I, and, I, and I genuinely mean that. I mean, I, I had no idea when I started a PhD bus in business where that would lead or whether it was a good decision. And of course it did turn out to be a brilliant decision in terms of, you know, it happened to be a job which matched my, my skill set. Um, so, but my point is that, that even though I got lucky, the point is, you know, that was sort of third time lucky. So, so being prepared to try a few times and to, and to acknowledge that you don't really know exactly what you do want to do, but often you kind of know what you don't want to do. Um, you know, the reason I did a PhD in 91, I still remember to this day, um, I got a job offer in a compensation and benefits human resource consultancy. Um, and I didn't have any particular interest in compensation and benefits. And they said, and of course, you'll be working six days a week. And and I just thought, I'm not sure this is for me. I mean, why why would I embark on a career in, in it just because I happen to have been offered a job in it? And that was the point where I said, I have no idea where it's going to land, land me, but starting a PhD in business, at least I know that's going to be interesting. And so that was that was sort of learning from mistakes and near mistakes. I guess the other thing I'll say, I mean, I was probably too deferential as a kid. I was too open to kind of um, l listening to people senior to me and believing that what they said must be true because they they said it. And I I was a little bit shy at speaking up and so forth uh, all the way through my MBA and indeed my my early business career. You know, now I am, you know, gosh, latter part of my career. I love it when, you know, the 25 year olds push me back and say, you know, I this from what I from what I see, this doesn't make any sense. Or, you know, I and of course I there's a there's limits. They can be too pushy, but I I just crave the feedback from the people who are closer to the front line in terms of what's happening and and of course you know if, if they're just deferential and doing what they think are, that they think but i need to know because i'm doing it i know better then that's not going to be very helpful at all so there you go be less deferential that's my uh, wow i i mean tr try new things you know uh move forward with confidence get feedback as much as possible I, i'm starting to see some of the the personality characteristics that led you to some of the your approaches in your in your research so really cool um okay two just playful questions that we ask everybody and most everybody hates me asking but i'm doing it anyways so um one can learn much from uh, a person by what they read um of course, that could be academic or that could be uh, a, a nice piece of fiction you read on on your holiday. Um, I had one uh, founder here once that said, I've got five kids. All I read is Dr. Seuss. So with that being said, um, what book is on your bedside table? Do you have something you could recommend? 
Um, I've got a couple of books on the bedside table. One is um, a trashy novel, and that helps me to sort of unwind and go to sleep. Uh, it's one of these Lee Child. I don't know if Lee Child is a big name in the US and the UK. He may not be big in, in Europe, but he's he's probably you know one of the best-selling authors of all times. So that's the kind of the unwinding book. Um, I'm blanking on its name, but Jonathan Haidt's very famous book, um, Jonathan Haidt, the NYU professor, I'm just blanking on its name off the top of my head. Perhaps you can send it out in the podcast later. <laughs> um, but he's, I mean, he's just a brilliant guy. He's a kind of a political theorist. But his insights into why, you know, why, you know, Republicans and Democrats cannot agree on anything. It's just, it's just inspiring. And it's proper academic research, but it's so kind of influential in terms of how you look at the entire world. So there's a couple of uh, it, it's so easy for uh, someone that's not American to see inspiration in that. When I hear, when I l read about that topic, it's like a thousand hot knives cutting through my flesh. <laughs> uh, all right, what, one last question: um, When you when you put on the headphones, go for a walk, go for a run, go to the gym. What's uh, what's cycling on your playlist? Yeah, so I, I'm I'm now into podcasts actually. Um, and I, I listened to one, uh, I think his name is Benedict Evans. He's a tech tech guy. And if you want to just be a little bit up to date on what the latest is happening in blockchain or whatever, he's good. Um, and then this is, I'm afraid this is a rather UK specific one. Um, but a couple of former politicians, Rory Stewart and Alistair Campbell, uh, they come from different parties, but they, they like to disagree agreeably. And right now they disagree. They both agree violently that Boris Johnson is an idiot, but they disagree on most other things. And so it's fascinating to hear politicians actually arguing, but to try to understand each other's point of view rather than just for the sake of disagreeing. So there you go. There, there is such a, a great message in that disagreeing agreeably, something I feel like we've forgotten to do in recent years. But Dr. Julian Birkinshaw. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, such an interesting topic, interesting conversation. Um, I will now be going into my work looking at things through a, a even different lens than I have before. So really, really a pleasure. Perfect. Thanks so much. Yeah. And thanks, Dries, for joining us once again. Always a pleasure. And uh, thank you for bringing on such an uh, inspiring guest. But Great to see you also, all. Pleasure to meet you. Thanks. Well, folks, that was Professor Julian Birkinshaw, Professor of Strategy and Entrepreneurship at London Business School. We've got a great collection of guests teed up in the coming weeks, ranging from world-class entrepreneurs to investors, academics to fresh young startups. So stay tuned for what's ahead as the lessons will keep coming all summer long. And if you like what you're hearing, please be sure to like, subscribe, and leave a review on your favorite streaming service. If not, just skip that part. Bis nächstes Mal.